How could you do it without God? Amen. I say amen to that. That would be a real one, wouldn't it? Yes. Could not be done without the Lord. I'm not going to preach out all them. <laughs> I thought I might get a hold of something kind of heavy, you know, so I better be prepared. <laughs> but oh, very, very light. So maybe there's not very many questions among the people then. It's um, just very simple and light question. But I'm glad to try to answer them the best that I can by the help of the Lord. And if Sister Oregon Bright is in tonight, Sister Ruth, are you here, Sister Ruth? Over here, I have the, oh yes, I have the, address here. And no, I don't. Well, I can get it right out here. I had it in my pocketbook and I left my pocketbook at home. Now, if the police catch me going home, Brother Fleeman, you come to my rescue. Tell Billy I haven't left my pocketbook at home. I'm driving without license tonight. <laughs> and, uh, I thought I had it in my pocket. I just changed clothes. I'd run in this afternoon and was cutting some grass right quick and had to quit and hurry up and get in, change clothes and run down here. And I, I brought the lexicon, but you can get it right afterwards out of there. Don't feel bad about that letter. If I'd ever got no one worse than that, that'd be a fine letter. <laughs> that was good. That was very, very nice. I told you I wouldn't read it, but I slipped up on it. You know, I just couldn't hold it any longer. I just wondered what you said. <laughs> and it was very, very nice. Wrote like a real school teacher ought to write. <laughs> that was good. And I appreciate it. And it... Uh, it gives you, see, I love letters of someone that would, would differ a little with you. See, if you go along all the time, nobody differs with you, you're stale. you got to get a little different so you can understand, dig down, and, and you just get one rut. If you don't watch, then you, then you get into trouble when you do that. you got to just kind of keep moving on and get somebody to differ with you and fluff up your feathers once in a while. Over in Africa, I found two little lines. And there's little bitty fellows about like that, speckled little bitty lines, little line, little lines. Now, they look like kittens, just so little like that, little, prettiest little things they just play. And I was going to bring them back to America. I had them in a bird cage. I was going to bring them back, but I couldn't find any, anything to inoculate them, any toxin. And they wouldn't let me bring them in the United States without them being inoculated first. And I couldn't find it in all Africa. But if you want to know whether he was a lion or not, just cuff him back a little bit. <laughs> He'd square off and let you know he was a lion. <laughs> so, so that kind of lets you know where he was standing. That's what you have to do once in a while. He'll kind of fluff the feathers backwards to find out. But now, we don't get angry like the lion. We just, we just love that. Uh, to People to ask questions. And questions like that, Sister Ruth, is very, very good to me. It's, uh, I, I love that, see. It's always real nasty, kind of. I hate to get that. <laughs> but them, that was fine. Now, we got some good stirring, just home questions. Um, there's a preacher back there in the back room just now. Asked me, said, uh, the two prophets of Revelations 11, would they come in before the rapture or just before they're taken away of Israel and what... Now, that's the kind of questions that it, it ties you around. But these simple questions like this is all right. But now, before we start, let's bow our heads for prayer. Father, it is noted that it, when you were 12 years old, you were found in the temple with the scribes and the sages, uh, discussing with them the scriptures, and they were, they were astonished at a man of old and well trained in the scriptures and yet see a little boy of about 12 years old could just just confound him in the explaining of the scriptures you was about your father's business you said to your mother nor sound not that i must be about my father's business to explain the scriptures with their spiritual meanings and now we pray lord that that thou knowing how weak and frail we are and how subject we are to mistakes, that you'll just come with us tonight in the form of the Holy Spirit and will explain the Scriptures to us. I'm waiting and depending on you. And if I'd ever at any time try to put my own thoughts or interpretation of some selfish thing to try to make it sound like that, the way I was explaining it would be right, close my mouth, Lord. 
like you would you did the lions when they come after Daniel. Thou art still the same God. And let it be holy as we depend upon the Holy Spirit. May He just reveal these things to us. And then as He speaks them, make them so plain that the one who asks the question will be able to receive it. Amen. And if it answers contrary to what I've always believed, then let my heart rejoice also, Lord, to know that I have found something new Amen. and some good way of the Lord. For you said, search the Scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they that testify of me. Amen. Now, after this Scripture teachings, it certainly would arouse many thoughts and so forth, and I pray, God, now that all these questions seem to be so sweetly and gently asked, may the Holy Spirit gently and sweetly answer them. For we ask it in Jesus' name and for the glory of God in the upbuilding of His church. Amen. Amen. There is many times that selfish motives to anything just ruins the whole taste of it. And now, questions after this scripture has uh, been asked. Now, if I hiss just a little bit tonight, I have a tooth out. And um, I put it in. I can't preach. I slow up when I'm preaching. I take it out and I almost whistle. Miss Billy Grimm told a story on him that the worst excited she ever seen him was he's got a tooth out in front. And he lost it and he had a television program right away and, and he couldn't. It was on a plate with some more back teeth on it. And when he goes to talk, he whistles through his tooth. And she said he was down on his knees praying and sweating ten minutes before the television cast. And finally they found it where it dropped out of a pair of his trousers in the toe of his shoes. One of the bellhops found it. That false tooth. And Miss Graham told it on him and uh, over here. And so I got it in a little piece of paper. I think it got right here in my Bible. And um, so it is kind of when we get a little old and decrepit, you don't have to lose these. It makes it bad. And so I... While I was out with Brother Roberson back there and them, I was brushing on it one morning and broke a piece off of it. And I had to take it in to doctor to get it fixed. So the Lord had his blessings. Now we're going, I, I'm going to try to get through every one of them if I can. And Brother Tony, by the grace of God, I got the interpretation to your dream. And it was wonderful. I'm so glad to see that. And it's a good interpretation that I guess I shouldn't give it publicly here, so I'll give it to you privately if you, if you, don't, if you want it in that way. He asked me the other night, he had a dream, and I couldn't tell him just what it was until I went to the Lord and prayed over it. And the Lord revealed it back to me and told me what the interpretation was. It's wonderful and good news for you, Brother Tony. Now, in the um, first question, I don't know which word to start first because they're all good ones. But now, we try not to take too long, and maybe we can finish them up Sunday if we don't get through them. Explain what it means by everlasting punishment in Matthew twenty five forty six. But the that's the question and the second question. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast into outer darkness. Is that about the same as casting them out of the mind of God? Well, now get your first question, which is found in Saint Matthew the. 20, the 25th chapter. Now, we'll, now, I've never studied these. Just looked at them in the back there and just tried my best to look them out the best that I, that I knew how. And uh, my, you turn with me in your Bibles as we study it. Now, I want to get this out of the Greek lexicon also so you get the, the original of it. And I, I like that. So then we'll have it in both... Um, in both the, the Greek and the Heather. And now this will be, will be kind of slow and studying because I have to reach out and grab the Scriptures just wherever I can find them and get them into their place. All right? Now, anybody want a Bible to study by? If you do, raise up your hand. We, I think we got three or four back here if you want to study by the a Scripture. All right, Brother Cox, you come here and get some Bible. And it, it's good for you if you can. Uh, there's one. And then just, yeah. you just take one down if you want to. That and... 
And anybody wants one, just hold up your hand. The boy will bring them right to you, see. And we want to study these together and just... Now, on this reading and the last uh, chapters, the first seven chapters of the book of Hebrews, after teaching, of course... The boy who taken these down, these subjects, Brother Mercer and Brother Gold, has got them and now fixing a publishment in book form. And uh, they've got them. Now, uh, we have nothing like halfway comb. We just scratch the surface. And I think they've determined them as taking um, the nuggets out of the, and just polishing the nuggets, just a few of the nuggets of the teaching of Hebrews. Brother Mercer will have them pretty soon in print. Anybody wants them. Now, this in here, it brings in, you can't go through just in evangelistic church, which this is, an evangelistic church. You can't go through a, a teaching without arousing the sufficiency and the thoughts of many of the people. You've got to. Now, I'm far from being a teacher, not a Bible expositor at all. But I never try to, to say anything or to even do anything but first, first asking or finding out my best thing for it. It was asked to me by a dear brother last night. He said, Brother Brennan, Brother Seward once said that you, you just can't pin you down anywhere. See? That you always got some way around to get out of it or get away from it. I said, well, the reason of that, I always try to think before I do anything, see? And then if the people ask me, then I can tell them what my thoughts was, see? But it's, if you think right, and before you do anything, try to take the side that God would have you to take, then it really would be hard to be pinned down. You couldn't imagine the time that um, at Ahab tried to pin Elijah down. Could you imagine the time that the Pharisees tried to pin Jesus down? See, he had, he had the answer quickly because everything he'd done, he did it by the will of God and he, that's the way he, he could get it. Now, that's the way we want it with this. Now, the question is asked, we'll keep with the question, explain what it means by everlasting punishment in Matthew 25, 46. Now listen real close to everybody now in Matthew 25, 46. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment. Now, the question is, what, explain, now the word everlasting comes from the word from ever and forever and forever is a space of time. It only means so much time as forever. Now, if you'll just read I don't know who wrote the questions because no one put their name on them. It didn't have to be. I don't want them. See? But these shall go away into everlasting punishment. Now watch. That's the wicked. Now, a dear, dear person that asked the question, just read the rest of it. But the righteous unto life eternal. The wicked shall go into everlasting punishment a certain space of time. But the righteous has eternal life. You'll never find eternal punishment. Couldn't be. See, if they got eternal punishment, they got eternal life. They got eternal life, they're saved. See? It can't be. Now, if you watch the, the question, ask itself, answers itself, see? And these, now watch, I'll get before here. And they, sh and the 20, 44 first. And they also answered and said to him, Lord, when shall we... Be hungry, when with thirst and, and a stranger naked and, and, uh, and prison and did not minister unto thee. Then shall, then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, insomuch as you did it unto one of the least of these, you did it unto me. And these shall go away into everlasting, everlasting punishment. That's the wicked. But the righteous into eternal life. See the difference? The wicked has everlasting punishment, but everlasting is the space of time. Now, if it would have been the same, it would have been written, and these shall go into everlasting punishment, the others shall go into everlasting life. 
See? Or they should go away into eternal punishment other than eternal life. See, if there's an eternal punishment to be punished forever and ever, then he's, an etern- he's got eternal life and the only one eternal life, and that comes from God. Everything without a beginning has no end. Everything with a beginning has an end. See what I mean? Now, the scripture itself that the, the dear person answered, now if you'll take it in the lexicon, and these shall go forth into Ammon, cutting off, and to, ever, and to fire the lake of fire. Now, the word A-I-N-I-O-N means the space of punishment. In the Greek lexicon right here, space of punishment, or time of punishment. See? They shall go away into a time of punishment. The word is used A-I-N-I-O-N, aeon, which means time a time, a limited time. Then take it back into the into the translation here of the English. Everlasting is a limited of time. See? It comes from the Greek, a limited of time, the word aeon, or A-I-N-I-O-N. Aeon means a limited time of punishment. But, then read the others, but these shall go into eternal that's a different. See? Eternal life. Eternal comes from the word of eternity, and eternity had neither beginning nor end. It's forever and forever. Now, that should answer that. See? Because if you'll just read the scripture real close, you'll see, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous. The wicked shall go into everlasting punishment, be punished for a space of time, maybe a billion years, I don't know. But you'll certainly be punished for your sins. But as certain as sin had a beginning, sin has an end. Punishment had a beginning, and punishment has an end. And hell was created for the devil and his angels. See? All right. Now, there, I got another one down here to answer into that just in a few minutes, which is a beautiful one to tie into it. Now, but these here. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into darkness. Is that about the same as casting them out of the mind of God? No, it wouldn't be the same. Now, you're referring here to the wedding supper. Now, and the children of the kingdom, as was asked here... The children of the kingdom are the Jews. And they were cast into outer darkness. And they we have been cast into outer darkness. And they went through the time of the weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. They were cast into outer darkness because it would give you and I a space to repent. But they were never cast out of the mind of God. He'll never forget Israel. And Israel, as any reader of the Bible knows, is referred to the children of the kingdom. See, it's the kingdom, the promise. In other words, God dealing with the nation when he dealt with Israel, which is the children of the kingdom. Now, you remember he said there, and Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in one place would come and set into the kingdom at the end time. See, and at Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would be in the kingdom. They were. They were the kingdom blessing people. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. Now, where the reference comes from here is the, is the bridegroom. When the bridegroom come, while they were five of the virgins went out to meet the Lord, and, and they didn't take any oil in their lamp, and the, uh, uh, the other five took oil in their lamp. Now, if you'll notice, it's a beautiful picture both with the Jew and the Gentile as they're rejected. Keep in mind that there's three classes of people all the time. The Jew, the Gentile, the formal, the Jew, Gentile, and the church. And if you get those mixed up, you'll sure run into trouble when you hit Revelations. For if you don't, like Mr. Bohannon said to me one time, said, Billy, anybody would try to read the Revelations that have nightmares. Why, well, he said, here's a bride down here on earth and a and the dragon spurting water out of his mouth to make war with her. And said, then the same time, 
that the bride is standing as 144,000 Jehovah Witness doctrine on Mount Sinai, and at the same time the bride's in heaven. <laughs> no, no, you're mistaken. There's three classes of people. See? That is the rejected Jew, and there is the sleeping virgin that the waters, it's not the woman's seed, it's the remnant of the woman's seed that the dragon spurted water out of his mouth, Revelations 11. And then, actually, the 144,000 Jews was absolutely not the bride. They are the remnant of the Jewish church. And the Jehovah Witness doctrine, which puts them as the bride, I don't see how you could do that. Because it's not the bride. If you'll notice over in Revelations there, it said, and they are virgins. And they are eunuchs. And what was a eunuch? They were eunuch was the temple guards that guarded the queen. Because they were, they were men that were made sterile. They had, did you notice that they had not defiled themselves as women? They were temple eunuchs. And it was a selected number that God had taken out of the elect of the Jews. Now, if you'll notice, if we could just get that just a moment, uh, so it'll kind of settle it in your mind, where you can, re let's get Revelations, the seventh chapter, and we'll find out here now wh what it says. It's a beautiful thing. And after this, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth. Now, this parallels Ezekiel 9 where he saw the destructions of the Jews, and here he sees the destructions of the Gentiles. Revelation, the seventh chapter. And I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds, winds means war and strife, that the winds should not blow upon the earth or on the sea or any tree. That's war, holding. Oh, if we had time to go into detail on this question. That happened, that's where Russell got mixed up. Russell prophesied, seeing this coming, he prophesied it would be the coming of the Lord Jesus, not knowing that it was the, the sealing away of the church. See? And they wondered how the World War, First World War, look, it stopped on November the 11th at uh, the 11 o'clock in the day. The 11th month, the 11th day, and the 11th hour. And immediately after that, the water baptism in Jesus' name was revealed and the baptism of the Holy Ghost to the church. Exactly immediately after that. And if you take it on over in Revelations, how we tied it together, and between the Philadelphian age and the Lady of Sin and the Methodists had the Philadelphian age, the brotherly love, and the last age, church age, was the Lady of Sin age, which is lukewarm age, and he said in there, I have set a door, open door before you. An open door. And if you'll refer those scriptures back, it'll tie the entire message right into one place there to show you exactly. Watch. Hit everything of in Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and baptism, which we're to get into it directly, which is absolutely a Catholic creed and never a Christian doctrine. No, sir. I, just We got it right here tonight to come into it with the Lexan, too. See? Yes, sir. And with history also. Never was anybody ever baptized like that in the Bible, or not for the first 600 years after the Bible. And I can prove it right here by the Catholics' own doctrine that they're the one who started it and sprinkling and poured. They come out of there into the Wesleyan Church, into the Methodist Church. The Methodists brought it through to the Baptists. The Baptists brought it on through, and it's still a false doctrine and can come back in the Bible and prove to you that the Bible said... That you have a name that you live, but you're dead. That's exactly right. And they, I can prove that the Bible taught that they would use his name in baptism until the dark age. According to the fourth age of the, the church age, the Pergus church age. And he said, in doing that 1,500 years of dark ages, everyone said, you have a little light left because you've not denied my name. When he come to that other age over there, the Catholic age, he said, you have a name that you live, but you're dead. And you've denied my name. There you are. See, it just all ties one big beautiful picture together to the entire Bible. Now notice this. 
holding the four winds. And I saw another angel ascending from heaven, having the seal of the living God. The seal. Now, what is the seal of the living God? Now, you Advent brethren are going to say, keep the Sabbath day. I want you to show me that in Scripture. It's not there. Not one place that is a seal. If you'll read Ephesians 4.30 right quick, you'll find out what the seal of the living God is. Ephesians 4 and 30 says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby you're sealed Amen. until the day of your redemption. Amen. Not till the next revival, but it's got eternal security. <laughs> Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby you are sealed until the day of your redemption. See, Ephesians 4 30 doesn't say that. Then take your Mars readings and run all the rest of the way through the scriptures there and find out. Now, seal until the day of your redemption. Having the seal of the living God. Now remember, the Holy Ghost was not taught as the baptism of the Holy Ghost until after World War I. We just celebrated our, our golden jubilee, the 40 years, or the 40th year of the jubilee. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth or the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea or any tree, until we have sealed the servants. Now you're getting down to your question. The children, see? The servants of our God in their forehead. Don't hurt. Don't destroy the earth. Don't let an atomic bomb be bursted. Don't have a complete thing until the servants of our God is sealed. Now, if we could take that back down and run back there, how that, and even on the decline of the world's war in the second volume, when General Albee had fought into, he hit the lines of Jerusalem, and he was wired back to the king, of England and said, I don't want to fire on the city on the account of the sacredness of it. He said, what shall I do? He said, pray. And he flew over it again. And when they did, they said, Alibis are coming. And there were Mohammeds in there. Thought he said, allies are coming. And they hosted the white flag and surrendered an alibi, marched into Jerusalem and took it without firing a shot, according to the prophecies. That's right. And turn it back over to the Jews. Then they raised up a Hitler to persecute the Jews and all around over the world and run them back in there. And the Bible said he would bring them back on the wings of an eagle. And when they began to come back to Life magazine and then packed it a few weeks ago, where they brought them back by the thousands into Jerusalem, and they went to packing those old ones off on their back, they were interviewed. I've got it all on reel and picture. And he said, there hung the four-star flag of David hanging there, the oldest flag in the world, the first time it's been flown for 2,000 years. Jesus said, when the fig tree puts forth its bud, yeah. this generation shall not pass. Yeah. And here they bring them old in and said, what are you coming back to die in the homeland? Said, no, we've come to see the Messiah. Yeah. Brother, I tell you, we're at the door. There's a servant, Sam, who is way down here about this bunch of Jews that would cheat you out of your false teeth if they could. That's not the Jew he's talking about, but it's those down yonder who's kept their, their laws and things and never even knew there was a Messiah. Amen. And brother at Stockholm, brother um, Petrus, sent him down a million New Testaments. And when they got him, they were reading him. They said, well, if this be the Messiah, let us see him do the sign of a prophet and we'll believe him. What a setup for my ministry. Amen. I was within two hours of the gates of Jerusalem to go in. And I was at Cairo, Egypt. And I was walking on there and the Holy Ghost said, don't go now. I thought, I was just imagination. My ticket's done. Bought them on the road. The man's out there to meet me. The whole group of schools and so forth. I walked a little farther. The Spirit said, don't go. Don't you go. I went back to the ticket agent. I said, I'll cancel this ticket. I want to go up to Athens, Greece, to my heart's seal. And he said, what your ticket costs for Jerusalem, sir? I said, I want to go to Athens instead of going to Jerusalem. The Holy Spirit waiting. That hour hasn't come just yet. It just isn't just right. What seal the servants of our God in their forehead, saying, hurt not the earth, till we seal the servants of our God in their forehead. Anyone knows that that's the seal of the Holy Spirit. Amen. What? And I heard the number of them that were sealed. Now, if they're not Jews, watch this. And there were sealed 144,000, all of the tribes of the children of Israel. Amen. Not a Gentile in them. That's at the end time. Watch. The tribe of Jude, 12,000. The tribe of Reuben, 12,000. And on down, Gad, 12,000. Nephilim and, and uh, um, 
and all the way down to the Asher and, and uh, Zerbalan and all these 12 tribes of Israel and 12 times 12 is what? 144,000. There's the 144,000 Jews. Amen. Not Gentiles, Jews. Amen. That's not a thing to do with the bride. So Jehovah's Witness is wrong on their doctrine. The Bible plainly says that they are Jews and not Gentiles. They are the servants of God. And the Gentile never was considered a servant. We are sons and daughters, not servants. Amen. Now, read the rest of it. Like the man eating watermelon and said, that's good, but let's have some more of it. All right, God's got plenty of it here. Now, I just noticed. Now, now we're on the 8th verse. And of the tribe of Zublin sealed 12,000. All the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000. Of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000. See, John being a Jew, recognized every one of them, seen the 12 tribes of Israel, 12,000 out of each tribe, 12 times 12 being 144,000. There they are. Not the church. The Jews. The Bible said here they were all the children of Israel. Amen. Every tribe name. Now watch. Ninth verse. After this. Amen. Now here comes the bride. Amen. After this I beheld, lo, a great multitude which no man could number. Amen. There's your t- temple eunuchs. There's this 144,000 little spot. Just little temple guards that's going to be with the bride. Just her, just her escort. That's 124,000 is the escort to the bride. The temple eunuchs. Watch. Of course, I know you go back over here at 14th and say, while they're with the bride, wherever. They, absolutely, the eunuchs travel with the queen wherever she went. Truly. But what were they? They were nothing but escorts. And that's just exactly what the Scripture declares it to be here. Notice. And after this, And lo, a great multitude which no man could number of all nations, kindreds, people, and tongues. There's your Gentile bride coming up. All right. These stood before the Lamb. There's their Savior. The Lamb. Not the law. The Lamb. Grace. Hmm. Clothed with white robes. Watch a few minutes say that the white robes ain't the righteousness of the saints. And palms in their hand. And they cried with a loud voice that this ain't a Pentecostal revival. I never heard one. Saying, salvation to our God which sat upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood around about the throne and about the elders. And the four beasts fell upon the, uh, before the throne on their faces and worshiped God saying... Amen, blessing, glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, honor, might, power be to our God forever and ever. Amen. That sounds like a camp meeting time, doesn't it? Amen. It's going to be. Who was that? 144,000? Not at all. This great number that no man of all kindred tongues and nations. Can't you see, my dear friend? I want Just read it. Oh. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these, and which are arrayed in white robes, and whence cometh they? The elders said to John, which was a Jew that recognized the 144,000, and said, Now you knew them, they're all Jews, but who are these? Where'd they come from? See what the elder said? One of the elders answered, that's the elder before the throne, answered me, saying, What are these, which are arrayed in white robes, and whence cometh they? Now, we all know the Jews and their covenant and so forth, but when these come, I watch. And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. I, I, I don't. John said, it Just pass me. I don't know. And he said unto me, These are they that came out of great tribulations through trials and many dangers, toils and snares. I have already come. See? These come up out of great tribulations and have washed their robe. In the church, does that sound right? No. I washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Amen. They are before the throne of God and serve Him day and night. Who serves me in my home? My wife. Is that right? Yeah. And in His temple... 
That's who stays with me in my home and in my economy is my wife. She's the one who sits with me and washes my clothes and keeps things ready for me. And he that sitteth upon the throne shall dwell among them. Oh, my. Listen. And they shall hunger no more. It looked like they missed a few meals coming along. Neither shall they thirst any more, shall the sunlight on them no more, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of water, and God shall wipe all tears from their eyes. Amen. There she is. There's your bride, and there's 144,000, and there's your servants. So the children of the kingdom here, uh, a dear person who asked the question, as... Um, who asked this notable question. I think I might have left it back here in a, somewhere. But when they shall be cast out, doesn't mean that they will be cast out of God's mind. They are cast out of the spiritual benefits for a season. See, just for a little season. Because when the prophet saw Israel in this day that she was coming to, he said, well, will Israel be when the Sabbath will be taken away and and it's sell on the Sabbath the same as any other day and all these things. He said, well, will you, will you ever, will Israel be completely forgotten? He said, how high is it to the heavens? How deep is the earth? Measure that stick land before you. He said, I can't. He said, neither can I ever forget Israel. Amen. Certainly not. Israel will never be forgotten. So you see, everlasting and eternal is two different things. Israel was cast out, but not out of God's mind. And Paul speaks it over here. If I had, had time to study so I could quickly get to the Scriptures, I can refer to them to you. See, that comes on my mind. Paul speaking over there said that for we Gentiles to take heed the way we walked and what we done. Yeah. See, because of God's fair not the first branch. See, and we be just drafted in. See, and Israel, which was blinded for a season, he said, just for a season, Israel was blinded. That's right. But the veil will be lifted from their eyes. And that is when the last Gentile is born into the kingdom of God, then the veil's lifted from Israel's eyes, and they'll say, this is the Messiah who we look to see. Amen. That's right. But the Gentile door is closed. The ark is, is closed up. There's no more, ge- no more grace left for the Gentile at that time. Now, I take a whole lot of time on one question, and somebody say, oh, you don't get to mine. Well, we'll hurry up and see if we can get to it. All right. Here's a, a long one. And every bit of it, the woman asked or the man asked or whoever it is, is right. Is it not true that the Lord Jesus did not die for the whole world? Meaning, everyone in the world. But rather, I would explain that, but she, he or she or whoever it is looks like a woman's writing. But rather for these... Uh, Rather, for these in every part of the world, whom the Father did give him, these who before the foundation of the world God did ordain to eternal life, having elected them according to his own good pleasure. Absolutely, that's right. That's exactly right. Jesus died for not just to... He is purpose. Let's see, I believe, the, I believe the red question comes in on this. Scripture doubtless tells us that these are those who will not, they are those who will not be saved. Therefore, that's exactly right. The Scripture tells us that there is people who were foreordained of God to be condemned. Would you like to read that? Sort of always be out of your mind. All right. Let's turn over now to the book. Of, um, of Jude. Jude speaking here. <clears throat> Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ, the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. See who he addresses it to? Not the sinner. Not only evangelistic service, but to the sanctified and called. Amen. See, those who are already in the kingdom. Mercy unto you and peace and love be multiplied. Beloved, I give all diligence to write unto you the common salvation. It was needful for me to write unto you and to exhort you should you earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints. For there are certain men 
crept in unaware who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Amen. Now, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. Amen. Ordained of old. Not that God said back on the throne and said, I'll save this man, I'll lose that man. That wasn't it. God died, and when Jesus died, the atonement covered the entire earth for every person. But God, by foreknowledge, not that He will, He's not willing that any should perish. He wanted everybody to be saved. That was His, that was his eternal purpose. But if He was God, He knew who would and who would not be saved. If He didn't know, then He wasn't the infant God. So the Bible teaches that. Uh, we, if we had time, turn over here in Romans, the 8th chapter, and you could read it. Romans, the ninth chapter. Many other places in the Bible. Ephesians, the 1st chapter. And you can see that the election of God, that it might stand sure. God gave the covenant unconditionally. He sent Jesus to die for those who He foreknew. Amen. See? Not just to say, well, you say God don't know whether she'll be saved or not. God know that you'd be saved or whether you would or not before the world ever began or he wasn't God. Do you know what the word infant means? Look at, look at the dictionary and find out what the word infant means. Amen. Why, he knowed every flea that would ever be on the earth. Every fly, every gnat, every germ. Amen. He knew it before they ever come into existence or he wasn't God. Amen. Certainly he will. All right. Man, in there, God could not, not say, I'll take you and send you to hell, and I'll take you and send you to heaven. God wanted you both to go to heaven, but by foreknowledge, he knew that one would be a shyster and the other would be a gentleman and a Christian. See? Therefore, he had to send Jesus to die to save that man that he foreknew that wanted to be saved. Amen. You get it? Now, look here. Scriptures doubtly tell us that these are they who will not be saved. Therefore, if the atonement cover all the all of Adam's race, and some were lost because they did not avail themselves of the promise or the provision, would not uh, not free. Will he will be a mightier force than eternal plans and purposes of Almighty God? Would it be, the person now in this second question is asking, would not man's free will be a mightier force than the eternal plans and purpose of an Almighty God? No, my brother or sister. Certainly not. There is nothing more powerful. Man's will could never compare with the, the eternal purpose of God's judgment. It couldn't be. See? Now, your first question was correct. Your second question couldn't be, friend. Because look, look at the way you, it's written here, see? Would not man's free will be a mightier force than the eternal plans and purpose of Almighty God? Why, certainly not. How could the will of man be a mightier force than the purpose of Almighty God and man in his carnal condition to will what he wants to more forceful than what an eternal perfect God would be? Certainly not. It couldn't be. See? The eternal God whose purpose is perfect, how could you say that a, a carnal man down here, no matter how just and what he might be, his purposes would no wise compare with this the, the purpose of the eternal and almighty God. Yeah. Yeah. All right, sister. Yeah. That's right. Oh, well, I, I've read it wrong, Nancy. All right. Yes, you're exactly right then, sister. I didn't know it was your, your question. <laughs> all right. But see, where I got it here, see. Now, let me see. Cover all the Adam's race. And some were lost because they did not avail themselves themselves of its provision. Would not man's free will be a mightier force than the eternal plans and purpose of Almighty God? See, I, I misinterpreted your thought there. Yes, 
the eternal purpose of Almighty God. Well, that settles it. I guess everybody understands that. If you raise up your hands, if, if the eternal purpose of the Almighty God would sure be Amen. far, but far above what man could do. Now, I do not understand the light on water baptism in the 28th chapter of 19th verse of Matthew. What does this mean? Well, now, maybe it won't take me but just a minute. And let's uh, somebody turn with me, if you will, to Matthew, the 28th chapter, and the 19th verse, and we'll find out just what the person is the uh, 25. Now, this will make you strong if you just stay with it. It's, it's good, you see. It isn't evangelistic, but it's a... Uh... Now, we're... Now, here's where people try to say there's a contradiction in the Bible. Now, I want somebody to turn to it with Matthew 28, 19. Oh, no, I want somebody, Matthew 28, 19. I want somebody to turn to Acts 2, 38. Got your Bible there, Brother Neville? And I want you to read for yourselves now. And I'll show you a strict contradiction in the Bible. And uh, what the, the Bible, people say the Bible doesn't contradict itself. I want you to take this into consideration. And this makes the professors get gray. But it, it's simple. Now, I'll read Matthew 28, 19. You follow me. And some of it is Acts 2, 38. Have it ready. I'll begin unto the 18th verse. This is the closing chapter of Matthew. And Jesus came and spake unto, his deci- uh, spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Where's the Father's power? If all the power in heaven and earth is given to Jesus, God got powerless then, didn't he? Or did he just tell a story? Was he joking? He meant it. Do you believe he meant it? Well, if all power is given unto him, where's God's power at then? He was God. That's that's the thing there is to it. That's just all there was. See? He was God. Or either there's somebody sat there did have some power, don't have it anymore. See, so you can't, you can't confuse it. We'll get that right in on the same thing here. All right. All power in heaven and earth is uh, in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Acts 2.38. Now somebody read. Wait just a minute. Acts, the second chapter, the 38th verse. Now listen real close now and just be patiently. And we'll see now. Now this is 10 days later after Jesus told them now. Matthew 28, 19. Go therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Ghost. Now Peter, 10 days later, they never preached another sermon. They went up in the upper room of Jerusalem and waited there for 10 days for the Holy Ghost to come. How many knows that? This spot. Here's Peter. Peter has the keys of the kingdom. All right, we'll see what he does. Matthew, I mean, Acts 2, let's take uh, the 36th verse. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know surely that God has made this same Jesus who you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Both Lord and Christ. No wonder all power in heaven and earth is given unto him. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, Man and brethren, what shall we do? Peter answered, Peter said unto them, Repent every one of you and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Now there's a contradiction. Matthew said, Baptize the name of Father, Son, Holy Ghost. And Peter said, Acts 2, 38, 10 days later, Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then the next time repentance is pro- spoke over baptism in the Bible is Acts the, um, the 8th chapter when... Uh, Philip went out and preached to the, to the Samaritans. And they received the Holy Ghost and they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Next time it was spoke of was when the Gentiles received it, Acts 10, 49. And while Peter spake these words, Behold, the Holy Ghost fell upon them and heard them. For they heard them speak in tongues and magnify God. Then said Peter, Can a mid forbid water? See if these have received the Holy Ghost like we did at the beginning. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, let me have something here. Just show you a little something so you won't forget it. Go make a little illustration. I'm going to put... How many nationalities of people are there 
in the world. There's three, Ham, Shem, and Jephthah's people. How many knows that? We come from those three sons of Noah. Ham's people, Shem's people, Jephthah's people is the Anglo-Saxon. Shem's people is uh, the three generations. That's Jew, Gentile, and half Jew and Gentile. Now, notice when there is this is Ham, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, the first time baptism was ever spoke of was spoke of by John the Baptist. How many knows that to be true? All right, I'm going to lay it over here, way over here. John the Baptist. And John baptized the people in the river of Jordan, commanding them that they should repent and get right with God and sell their goods and feed the poor and the soldiers be satisfied their money and to get right with God. How many knows that? And he baptized them in the river of Jordan, not sprinkled them, not poured them, but immersed them. If you don't believe it, here's the lesson. Find out if it is in baptism, which is a baptized, immersed, put under, buried. Now, the first time baptism was ever spoke of was there. The second time baptism was ever spoke of, Jesus commissioned it. Matthew 28, 19. Next time baptism was spoke of was... Acts 2.38. The next time baptism spoke up was in the 8th chapter of Acts. The next time baptism spoke up was in the 10th the, uh, chapter of Acts. And then we come from the time where Jesus said, Here go ye, therefore teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Now let's straighten this scripture out first. I've told you that there's not one scripture in the Bible that will contradict another. I want you to bring it to me. I've asked that for 26 years and I haven't found it yet. There's no scripture that, con if it contradicts it, then it's a man written affair. No, sir, there's no contradiction in the Bible. Now, this you said, what about that? Here stands Jesus saying, Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptize them, and they Father, Son, Holy Ghost. And Peter turns right back around and said, Repent, everyone, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. There's your contradiction. Looks like it. Now, if you read it with a carnal mind and not an open heart, it'll be a contradiction. But if you read it open-minded, the Holy Spirit has hid this from the eyes of the wise and prudent. Jesus said so, and thank God for it, and has revealed it to babes such as would learn. If you've got a mind and not a selfish mind, but a willing heart to learn, the Holy Ghost will teach you these things. Amen. Now, if it don't compare, you say, how do you know you're right? Well, it compares with the rest of Scripture. If you don't, you've got a flat contradiction here. Now, I want to ask you a question. This is the last chapter of Matthew. I'll take it in a little form so that every one of you, the children, understand it. For instance, if you read a love story, and the back of it said... And Mary and John lived happy ever after. Well, you wonder who John and Mary was. They lived happy ever after. Now, if you want to know who John and Mary is, you better go back to the first of the book and find out who John and Mary is. Then get back to her and find out who Mary was and what family she come from and who John was and what family he come from and what his name was and how they were married and all about it. Is that right? Well, that's the same thing as reading the Bible here. When, look, Jesus never said, go baptize the people in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Ghost, the way Trinitarian people baptize. There's no scripture for that in the Bible. He never said, in the names, in A M E S, names of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. He said, in the N-A-M-E, name, singular. Look at your Bible and find out that's right, Matthew 28. In the name, not in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son. That's the way a triune preacher baptizes. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Ghost. That's not even in the Bible. Then in the name, you said, well, then in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Then there's a certain name there. Well, is Father a name? How many knows that Father's not a name? Father's a title. Son's not a name. How many know sons not a name? How many fathers is in here? Raise your hand. How many sons is in here? Raise your hands. Well, which one your name son? Which one name father? All right. Holy Ghost is not a name. Holy Ghost is what it is. How many humans is in here? Raise your hand. See, 
There you are. The Holy Ghost is what is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Neither one of them are names. There's no name to it. Well, then, if he said baptized in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost, we better go back and find out who Father, Son, Holy Ghost is. Let's turn back to the first chapter of Matthew, then. See who this fellow was that was supposed to baptize in what name. And we start out now with Matthew, the first chapter, and um, the 18th verse. Read closely, all of you. Now, you would ask the question. I want to give a little illustration here. Now, I'm going to put... Three things here, so that you'll understand clearly. Make illustrations. These Bibles and books to make illustrations. All right? I want you to watch me closely. Each one follow me now. Now, this here is God the Father. This here is God the Son. This here is God the Holy Ghost. Now, how many understand? You say it after me. Who's this down here? Holy Ghost. Who's this over here? Who's this here? That's where a Trinitarian believes that. See? That makes us heathens just as raw as they can be. The Jew. That's the reason you can't do nothing with a Jew. He said, you can't chop God in three pieces and give him to a Jew. But certainly not. You can't me either. See? No, sir. He's one God. It's exactly not three gods. Now, notice how, how, how simple it is. Now we're going to find out. Now, who is, this is who? Stop, speak out now. God the Son. Is that right? This is the Son. Well then, His Father is God. Is that right? How many believe that His Father is God? Raise up your hands. How many believe that God is the Father of Jesus Christ? All right. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. Now we're going back to find out who Father, Son, Holy Ghost is that Matthew said baptized in the name of Satan. The name. Not names now. Because it can't be named. Because there's no name there. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with a child of God the Father. Does the Bible say that? What does the Bible say? She was found with a child of the Holy Ghost. Then which one of these is his father? Now the Bible said that this is his father, and Jesus said that this was his father. Now, which one is his father? Now, if you had two fathers, now what about it? If you had two fathers, he's the illegitimate child. Now, let's just read on a little further. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man, was not willingly to make her public example, but was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not taking thee, Mary, thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the... The what? The Holy Ghost? Well, how can the Father be his Father and the Holy Ghost be his Father at the same time? Now, he had two fathers then, if that be right. No, sir. The Holy Ghost is God. Amen. The Holy Ghost is God. So God and the Holy Ghost is the same self person. Or he had two fathers. See, we find out who John and Mary is after a while. All right. We find out whether Peter was, Matthew was trying to contradict one another or not. See if the scripture contradicts itself. It's a lack of spiritual understanding. That's right. But while he thought on these, I got that one, the 20th verse, not 21st. And she shall bring forth a son, this person, which was of this one person, God, and thou shalt call his name. What? For he shall save his people from their sins. This was all done that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth the son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. By interpretation, God with us. So who was John and Mary lived happy ever after? Who was the one that said, Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptize men in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? Who was the, Father, the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? Well, certainly it was. Man. Sure. No contradiction to that. Not a bit. It just straightens the Scripture out. He was the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Man. God was Emmanuel dwelling with us, tabernacling in a body called Jesus. 
Now, the oneness teaching of the oneness church, I certainly disagree with them. Thinking that Jesus is one like your fingers one. He had to have a father. If he didn't, how could he be his own father? And if his father was a man like the Trinitarian says, then he was born to illegitimate birth with two fathers. So you see, you're both wrong by arguing. See? But the truth of it is that both Father, Son, and Holy Ghost is one personality. Dwelling in a tabernacle of flesh to take sin from the world. That's exactly right. God with us. Now, therefore, when Matthew 28, 19, now you search the Scriptures. And when you can find more one person in the Bible, now think of it, now don't let this pass over you. Where one person in the Bible was ever baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, come back to me and tell me that I'm a hypocrite and I'll put a sign on my back and walk through the city. It's not in the Scriptures from Genesis to Revelations. But every person in the Bible was baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. You say, wait a minute, preacher, what about John? He didn't baptize in any name at all. All right, we find out what happened. Let's turn over to, to the, um, uh, the Acts, the 19th chapter. That's where we find John's disciples. Every person was all baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. On up now to we find this group over here. Acts, the 19th chapter. And let's begin the reading now. And we find John's disciples. And it came to pass, while Apollo, which was a lawyer, converted, was at Corinth, Paul having passed through the upper coast of Ephesus, he finds certain disciples. They were followers of Jesus. If you just notice the previous chapter before there, they were having such a great time that they were shouting and rejoicing. How many knows that truth? And Aquila and Priscilla was attending the meeting, and Paul and Silas was beaten in stripes and put into jail. Is that right? And they come over here and found Aquila and Priscilla, and they were having a revival up there by a Baptist preacher by the name of Apollo, who was proving by the Scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Now, Paul finds him. Paul, having passed it up, of course, if this finds certain disciples. He said unto them, Have you received the Holy Ghost since you believed? Now, you dear Baptist friend, if that don't knock the, the props out from under your theology, <laughs> when you said you received the Holy Ghost when you believed, but Paul won't ask these Baptists, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? Now watch what they said. And they said unto him, we know whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, unto what? Now if you want to get to the Greek lesson here, he'll show you unto how was you baptized. Unto what was you baptized? And they said unto him, under John, back here. John baptized us. Now I want to ask if you had that baptism, would you be satisfied with it? The same man that walked Jesus out in the river and baptized Jesus Christ, that same man had baptized these people. That's a pretty good baptism. Not sprinkling, not pouring, but immersing in the old muddy Jordan at the same place Jesus is baptized. Think of that. Paul said, have you received the Holy Ghost since you believe? They, he, they said, we don't want to be in the Holy Ghost. He said, how was you baptized? They said, we've been baptized. How was you baptized? Unto John. Now watch what Paul said. Not sure. And he said to them, Were you about, uh, unto John? And, they, and then said Paul, John barely baptized the bapt unto repentance, saying unto the people, They should believe on him as come after that is on Jesus Christ. See? John only baptized unto repentance, but the water baptism in Jesus' name is for the remission of sins. Amen. The atonement wasn't made then. Sins cannot be remitted. Now, it was just answering of a conscience like under the law. Luke 16, 16 said the law and prophets were until John. Since then the kingdom has been preached. Now watch. And what? And Paul said on... Now watch. Have you received a fifth verse? And when they heard this, they were baptized again in the name of Jesus Christ. Is that right? Then these people, the people in Acts 2 were baptized in Jesus' name. The Jews were baptized in Jesus' name. The Gentiles were baptized in Jesus' name. And every person in the entire Bible was baptized in Jesus' name. Now find one place that anybody else has ever baptized any other way. Now I'll go right back here and show you where the Catholic Church admits it and say that you bow to it. 
and said there might be some Protestants saved because they have a few of the Catholic doctrines, such as the baptism in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, that the Holy Catholic Church has the right to change that solemnity from the name of Jesus to the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and a Protestant church admits it. This one don't. I stay with the Bible. I believe the Bible. You say, Brother Bram, you commissioned people to be baptized over? Absolutely. Paul did here. Now watch. Let's get to Galatians 1.8 and find out what Paul said. Though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you, let him be accursed. Amen. There you are. If we are an angel, and Paul, the same man, commissioned the people to be baptized over again, that had a lot better baptism than what... You have had my brother called John the Baptist for Jesus' own cousin, second cousin, baptized his own cousin in the river of Jordan and turned right around and baptized John's disciples and Jesus said, that won't work. Or Paul said it. And commissioned him to be baptized over again in the name of Jesus Christ before they could receive the Holy Ghost. After they've been shouting and praising God and having a big time. Having a great, great revival. And proven by the Bible with their theology that Jesus was the Christ. How many knows that's a scripture? That 18th chapter? Certainly did. There you are. So there's no question to it. Now let me give you a little keynote. Now he never went out of the order. But in Luke, Matthew, the 16th chapter, Jesus, when he come down off the mount, he says, Who do man say how the Son of Man am? Some say you're Elijah. And some say you're the prophets. And some say you're this, that. He said, But who do you say? Peter said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Watch. Blessed art thou, Simon of Jonah, the son of Jonas. Flesh and blood never reveal this to you. Amen. See, it has to come spiritual revelation. Flesh and blood never told Abel that he was wrong, uh, Cain that he was wrong. Never told Abel that Cain was wrong. But it was a revelation that Abel had. It was blood. We're coming into that question in a few minutes. It was blood, not fruits that took us from the Garden of Eden. It was blood. And Abel, by spiritual revelation, was revealed of God that it was blood. And he, by faith, Hebrews 11, 1 says, he offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, which God accepted his sacrifice. There you are. See, he offered it by faith, by revelation. Now watch, flesh and blood is not revealed as you come over to the Lord Jesus. But my Father, which is in heaven, has revealed this to you. And upon this rock, the revelation of Jesus Christ, upon this rock, I'll build my church. And the gates of hell can't prevail against it. That's what he said. Spiritual rest. And I say that you're Peter. And I'll give to you the keys of the kingdom. And whatever, because you've got a spiritual open channel between here and heaven. Flesh and blood, you never took a seminary, you never took a schooling, you never took a, a, a course of theology. But you depended on God, and God revealed it to you, and it's absolutely the clear scriptures that tie it together. I say you're a Peter. That's right, and I'll give to you the keys, and what you bind on earth, I'll bind in heaven. What you loose on earth, I'll loose in heaven. And Peter was a spokesman on the day of Pentecost, when they all scared to speak, he spoke up and said, Ye man of Judea, and you that dwell in Jerusalem... Let this be known to you and hearken to my words. These are not drunk as you suppose. Since they are out of the day, but this is that which spoke to the prophet Joel will come to pass in life. They said, God, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. And upon my hands, babes and maid servants, will I pour out of my spirit. And I'll show signs in the heavens above and in the earth below and pillars of smoke and vapor. It shall come to pass before the great and terrible day of the Lord shall come. And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. There you are. Oh, my. Let me freely speak unto you the patriarch David, he said. He's both dead and buried in his suppers with us unto this day. Therefore, being a prophet, he so foresaw him at his right hand, I will not be moved. More my flesh shall rest in hope, because I will not leave my soul in hell, neither suffer the Holy One to see corruption. And David is both dead, he said, and buried in his suppers with us this day. But being a prophet, he foresaw the coming of the just one, who God has made both Lord and Christ. Amen. Oh, my. There's your scriptures. There's the thing. That's it. Now, we find out here then that the correct way and the real way and only way that was ever ordained, and Peter had the keys. And on the day when he preached, they said, Now watch, here's the first church. You Catholics, listen to this. 
You Camelites, listen to this. You Baptists and Methodists, listen to this. You Pentecostals, listen to this. Church of God Nazarenes, Pilgrim Holiness, listen to this. Peter had the keys. And he had the authority. Or Jesus lied. And it's impossible for him to lie. Two immutable things, it's impossible for God to lie. Amen. He had the keys. Jesus gave him the keys. When he rose on the, on the third day like that, he had the keys of death and hell, but not the keys of the kingdom. Peter had them. It's exactly right. And I watched Peter. You got the keys hanging on your sign. And you're preaching. The question comes, the first converts of the new church, the early Christian church, now Catholic, now Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, are you on new church doctrine? Find out if you are. Man, brethren, what can we do? Peter stood up and said, Repent, every one of you. Look out, boy. The way you place those keys here, Christ will place in heaven. Repent, every one of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. That's how you get into this. For the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The keys went click here, and it went click there. That's the reason John's disciples had to come and be rebaptized again in the name of Jesus Christ before they could go into heaven and get the Holy Ghost. Amen. He kept his word. So don't confuse you now, does it? See? Certainly, Matthew 28, 19 was titles, not names. All right. How much more time we got? Can we have 15 minimal minutes to answer a couple more questions real quick? Can we? All right. We'll hurry right quick. I got two down here at the bottom. I wanted to get quickly join right in with this. If I could, then I'd get the rest of them Sunday morning. Was Cain an offspring of the serpent? This is a good one. If so, why did Eve not conceive until after Adam knew her? The same next question, the same way. Was it a, a literal tree from which Eve ate the fruit, she saw that it was good for food. All right, brother, sister, ever who it was, let's go back into Genesis and find out something here. Let's go to Genesis 3 and 8, if you will. All right. And listen real close now. Now, I'll bring the story up. It's all pure and holy. There was no sin or no defilement. Now, I'll get the, your, this first question first. The tree in the light, the middle of the garden, in the midst of the tree, the tree was the woman. Now, I'll prove that to you by the Scriptures if you just be patient a few minutes. We'll get first whether she, was, whether she conceived before she knew Adam or not. Or for, listen. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden and in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And the Lord called unto Adam and said, Or art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. Now, he didn't know that the day before. Something had happened. Something revealed to him that he was naked. And I hid myself. And he said, Who told thee that thou were naked? Has thou eaten of the tree? Eaten of the tree? Make him realize he was naked? As I've often said, this is no joke. I don't mean it for a joke. But if eating apples caused women to realize they're naked, we better pass the apples again. <laughs> it, wasn't na- it wasn't a tree of apple to eat. It was sexually. Watch. Has thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman who thou givest me to be with me, she gave me the tree. And I did eat. And the Lord said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me. Huh? 
The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. Long time before she had conceived see, by Adam. Adam knew her, and she conceived and brought forth a, uh, and brought forth uh, Abel. But I want to ask you just from a literal standpoint. Now, to prove to you that she was the tree, every woman is a fruit tree. How many know that? Aren't you the fruit of your mother? Certainly you are. And in the midst of the fruit, in the midst of the tree, the fruit that she did not touch. If you'll notice, wasn't Jesus a tree of life? Didn't he promise over in St. Matthew, uh, St. John, the sixth chapter, I'm the bread of life that come from God out of heaven? If a man eats of the woman, and look, through the birth of by the woman, we all die because we're subject to death. Is that right? Through a birth of the woman, through the birth of the man, we all live forever. The woman is a tree of death. The man is a tree of life. For the woman doesn't even bear life in her. That's exactly right. The, the life germ comes out of the man. See, correctly. Goes into the woman. The woman's nothing but an ink of and the baby is not connected on the navel cord. Not one speck of the mother's blood in the baby. Born in her blood, but not one speck in the baby. Go find, read the doctor book or ask your doctor. You'll see. It's not there. No, sir. Not one speck of it at all. She's just the egg. That's all. And the life comes from the man. That is a beautiful type to show that through the woman, through natural birth, we all have to die because we're dead to begin with. And only through the man Christ Jesus can we live. And there's the two trees in the Garden of Eden. Can't you see it? And watch. And in that day, there was a cherubim set a guard this tree that if they ever tasted that life tree, they would all live forever. How many knows that? They'd all live forever. And the first time they could taste it, the angel said, we'll guard it. And they put cherubims there with the flaming swords towards the east to guard it. They took it back to the east and guarded that tree, the flaming swords, so they could not get in to get it, this tree. And when Jesus came, he said, I am the bread of life, that a man eats this bread will never die. Amen. There's your tree. There's your woman. There's your sex. That brings death just as sure as a sexual desire. There's death left by it. And as sure as there's a spiritual birth, there's eternal life left by it. Death comes to the birth of a woman and life comes to the birth of a man. Amen. There you are. Now, let's take back to Cain. Could you tell me where that spirit and that meanness come from if Cain, look, if Cain was the son of Adam, which was the son of God, where did that evil come from? The first thing when he was born, he hated. He was a murderer. He was jealous. And I'll take the nature of his daddy, the very start in the beginning, Lucifer. And he was, in the beginning, he was jealous of Michael, what started the whole trouble. How many knows that? And Cain was the nature of his father, which he was jealous of. Of his brother. And slew him. That pure, that nature could not come out of that pure stream. It come, had to come out of this perverted stream. And notice, Cain, as soon as he was born, and, and then Abel was born, and then she conceived by Adam, and he knew, knew her, and she brought forth the son Abel, and Abel was a type of Christ. And when, a, when Abel was killed, Seth took his place, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. In time. But now, Cain worshipped all of his carnal works just like the carnal church today. They go to church, they worship. Cain worshipped. He wasn't an infidel. He wasn't a communist. Cain was a believer. He went to God. He built an altar. He done every religious thing that Abel done. But he didn't have the spiritual revelation of the will of God. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. There you are. Do you see it? He didn't have the spiritual revelation. And that's what's the matter with the church today. And Jesus said he'd build his church on that spiritual revelation. Amen. You get it? Yes. Oh my. Your eyes can come open now. Amen. See? The spiritual revelation. Cain come. He built an altar. He worshiped. He brought sacrifice. He knelt down. He praised God. He worshiped God. He done everything religious that Abel done. 
And God flatly refused him because he didn't have the spiritual revelation. Amen. Follow that same line of Cain right down through to the ark. From the ark right up into Israel. From Israel right on into Jesus. And from Jesus right on to this day. And see if that carnal, fundamental church stiff and starts scholarly. I mean man who of the scriptures, who knows all the doctrine and the theology. They can explain it, boy, just like that. But without spiritual revelation... That's right. That's the doctrine of Cain. The Bible said, Woe unto them! Because they went the doctrine of Cain, running the arrows of Balaam, and perished in the gainsaying of Korah. The same book, Jude, it said, they're predestinated to this condemnation. Certainly they are. See, what was Balaam? He was a bishop. He was over all the church. He kind of there just as fundamental as he could be. He offered, look at him, stand up there in the celebrity. Stand up there in the great celebrity. And they wasn't infidels, they were believers. That, that tribe of Moab come out of Lot's daughter. Lot who lived, Lot's daughter who lived with their father and conceived and brought a child. And that child was uh, spring the tribe of Moab. And they were a great denomination. Great, flowerly people. And they had princes and kings and celebrities. They had bishops and cardinals and everything. And here come a bunch of holy rollers up. The other group. Israel, a little old bunch that was undenominations, interdenominationals. <laughs> and they done everything to us on the map to be done bad, too. But what it was, they had the spiritual revelation. And God was with them with a pillar of fire. Oh, I know they had carnal things and people said such a bunch of backwash is that. Nothing to do but kick them out. But they had the spiritual revelation. Amen. And they had a smitten rock. They had a brass serpent. Yeah. They had a pillar of fire going yeah. with them. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah, I know you, you think I'm excited, but I'm not. I just feel good. Notice when I think that same God today lives with us. Yeah. It's still the spiritual revelation of the yeah. Word. It certainly it is. Praise it's God. eternally right. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, sir. Amen. There stood him up there, the fundamental that bunch of Baptists and Presbyterians stood up on the hill and got their bishop out there. And they were just as religious and the same kind of religion. They worshiped the same God. They said, look down at that bunch of trash. Well, they don't even have a denomination. They're nothing but a bunch of quacking, squealing, holing rollers. Is that right? Exactly it was. If you don't believe there were holy rollers, take back in Genesis and find out when they crossed and a miracle was performed. And Mary and grabbed the tambourine and went on the bank, beat the dancing in the spirit, and Moses sung in the spirit. That ain't a bunch of what we call free holy rollers, I don't know what is. Singing and jumping and praising. And all the time, the nations hated them. But God was with them. They had this spiritual revelation as part of that pillar of fire. Amen. And Moab said, now look here, we'll call all the cardinals and all the bishops and all the presbyters and get them out here. We'll do something about because we're a religious nation. We'll not let that propaganda get mixed up in our fine denomination. And so they got them out there and they built 12 altars. That's just exactly what Israel had, 12 altars. They put 12 sacrifices on it, bullocks, just exactly what Israel had, what God required. They put 12 sheep on it, representing the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. 12 sheep in both places. All the celebrities, the bishops, and all stood around. They slipped the sacrifice. They prayed. They raised their hands to Jehovah and said, Jehovah, hear us! What was he trying to do? And the old Balaam went forth like that, and the Spirit come down upon him. Sure, but he is a carnal. The Spirit can fall upon the hypocrite. The Bible says, you heard me teach that now, the rain falls on the just and unjust. But it has to compare with the Word. There's where you get it. Then, when he did, and when the Spirit on him told the truth, he tried to curse Israel. And he blessed Israel. Now, if God disrespects a fine church and a fine bishop and a wonderful pastor, a scholarly bunch of people, he was duty bound to accept that sacrifice. Because he was just as fundamentally right as Israel was right. But he didn't have the spiritual revelation of the Word and the will of God. There you are. That's the difference today. Look at Jesus. 
They said, away with that guy. We know he's a Samaritan. He's crazy. Well, you teach us. Well, you was born in adultery. You want nothing but an illegitimate child to come with. Who's your daddy? Say, God's your father, you blasphemer. What do you mean to tell us? We've been preachers. We've been bishops. To our great, 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 great grandfathers as preachers and bishops. We were born and raised in the church. We've been to the highest of seminaries. We know every word to the letter. And you try to teach us. Where'd you ever go to school at? Where'd you get this learning? He said, you're of the, you're a father of the devil, said Jesus. They had no signs and wonders among them. They had no divine healings and things among them. They had no blessings among them. But Jesus was absolutely a spiritual revelation of the Scriptures. They said, well, it's written so and so. And Jesus said, yes, it's also written. But God vindicated His man by His signs. Peter said the same on Acts 2. He said, you man of Israel, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you. But signs and wonders which God did by him in the midst of which you all yourself know. There you are. Him being delivered to the, by the, four, uh, by the uh, big Sanhedrin castle up there. But by the foreknowledge of God, God foreordaining him to die this death. You delivered him up with cruel, wicked hands. You crucified the Prince of Life who God's raised up. And we're witnesses of it. Amen. What a preacher. Didn't he couldn't even sign his own name, but he knew God. Amen. They said they took heed to him and he'd been with Jesus. Certainly, it's a spiritual revelation. Oh, my. Now, there you are. Cain was just in that line. That carnal church is in the same line today. The spiritual church still has the pillar of fire, still has the signs, wonder, still has the same Christ, which vindicates all the way from the dying lamb and in the Garden of Eden until the second coming of the lamb. Absolutely the same Yesterday, today, and forever. And that line of Cain, religious and polished and scholarly, right down the same, just the same, every day, just the same. Criticizers and persecutors, as Cain was of Abel, so are they today and have been and always will be. Carnal, unbelievers. That's right. Uh, Genesis 3 and 8, and also I put 20 here. I was looking a while ago. And Adam called... And Adam called his wife Eve because she was the mother of all living. See, that was after this beguiling had already took place. Cain was... Now, wait, you say, how could a snake, a serpent... But, brother, watch here, the Bible don't say he was a serpent. The Bible said he was the most subtle of all the beasts of the field. He wasn't a reptile. He was a beast. He was a... And there, now, let me just give you this as a little token between us, if you will. That's where science is all mixed up. The closest thing they can find to a man is a Japanese. How many know that? But there's something between that. They can't make the Japanese bones meet with the man's bones yet. It's the closest thing. They can bring him up from a polywog. They can bring him up from a tadpole. They can bring him on up to the animal. And every animal, they can bring him to a bear. You take a bear and pull the skin off of it just like a little woman. Just the same thing. Take her back and everything. Stand there and pull, pull the woman like, stand the woman like that. It's just the same as a, as a, as a bear. The foot runs out the same and the hand runs out like this. It's like a human being. But a chimpanzee comes closer than that. It's almost, but they can't find it. Here's a little secret if you want to know it. You know what's that? It's hid from them. They can dig all the bones they want to. They can dig, the sculptors can dig in the science and the, and the chronologists can measure the scales of time with the atomic measures, but they'll never catch it. For that was the serpent. That was more like a man than anything else there was on earth. And God cursed him and put him on his belly. And he's turned plumb back to a snake with no resemblance of a man. I just scratch your head. I'm signing this and I'm take that for a while. But the Bible declares that. He was the most subtle of all the beasts of the field. That's right. He was that joint that stands between man and monkey. And God cursed him and put him plumb back on his belly because of the, of the thing that he had did. He beguiled this woman and she brought forth her first son, which was Cain, after the nature of the serpent's own uh, inspiration, the devil that got in the serpent that did that. And then she conceived and brought forth. She conceived again after she was beguiled. Now watch. She beguiled. She was almost, well, she done wrong. But she literally was legitimate when she conceived by her husband. 
For that might have been many, many times afterwards. Many months and many days afterwards. You can't tell that. We don't know. But she did bring forth uh, Adam. And someone even got the question to say, well, the son, he said, she, when Cain was born, said she got a son of the Lord. Absolutely. Certainly it had to be. It was the law of nature. That's just exactly the way you are today. When you're born, God just doesn't come down and make you. You're an offspring of your father and mother. And you'll be, they'll be, your children will be all springs of you. It's reproduction all the time. Right on down like seed trees and things like that. But back to the original. I hope that explains it. How much time we got? Haven't got any more. Listen to this good one for next, for beginning Sunday. By one spirit we're all baptized into one body. We'd like to know that. Christ at the time, I think I... Get up some scriptures, good scriptures on that. Here's a good one. It's like, would you suffer me just one more minute or two to answer this? It can answer itself. When, when you say the wicked shall not burn eternally, well, I got Jehovah Witness on the run, haven't I? When you say the wicked will not burn eternally, do you mean in hell or in the lake of fire? I know it says in Revelations, that's the 20th chapter, that hell will be cast into the lake of fire. If they do not burn eternally, then what becomes of them? Just as I have just got through saying, brother or sister, whoever it was, they become extinct. There's no more to them. They had a beginning and they're the end. There's just nothing no more. How, will, how long they will burn? It's just hard telling but look, there, if you can just get this in your mind, see, it's very simple. There is but one type of eternal life. And that comes through God himself. And God alone is eternal life. <clears throat> if you just get here in the lecture, look up. The Greek word zoe. Zoe is eternal life. Eternal life is God. And Jesus said, I give unto them eternal life. And if you look here at the lection, it says, Zoe. That's the only eternal life there is. No place in the Bible where it ever says there will be an eternal hell. It said they'll burn forever and ever. Now, to get the word forever and ever, look at the on, aeon. Did you notice here in the Bible, how many have ever heard it said, and aeons and aeons? How many knows that aeon is a space of time? Why, well, sure. Anybody knows that. Aeon is a space of time. And they shall burn for aeons. That's spaces of time. Cast into the lake of fire and shall burn for aeons. Aeons means the spaces of time. They may burn for a hundred million years in punishment. But finally, they have to come to an end to be extinct altogether. See? Because everything that is not perfect is a perverted off of the perfect and it had a beginning so it must have an end. But we who believe on the Lord Jesus Christ has Zoe, God's own life in us, and have eternal life. Not have life forever and ever. The sinner has life forever and ever. But we have eternal life. Brother Cox, not long ago, was sitting on my runway before we put the, we had the rocks there. He picked up a little old fossil and he said, Brother Branham, how old is that? Oh, I said, Cronos, you might say 10,000 years old. Some kind of little sea monster that lived at one time, a little sea animal. I live way back in the ages gone by. He said, just think how short human life is to that life. I said, oh, but brother, <laughs> that thing has an end. But the life that we have in Christ has no end. Amen. That may live two or three forevers, but it'll never have eternal life because eternal life comes from God alone. Amen. Eternal he that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me has eternal life and shall never come to the judgment but pass from death unto life. Amen. There you are. You get eternal life by being a believer. An unbeliever has life forever. An eternal, uh, a believer has eternal life and cannot perish because it's eternal. But a believer, he will go, uh, unbeliever will go through the world He'll have miseries, woes, what he calls having a big time. Whoopee! Having a big time. Women, wine, big time. He thinks he's going on. He'll die. He'll go into a lake of fire and brimstone which burns where it's burning and going on forever and forever, maybe for a hundred million years. 
His soul may be tormented in a lake of fire and brimstone. I, you say, will it be just like regular brimstone? I believe it'll be a million times worse than that. I believe you couldn't indeed describe it by, by a literal fire. The only reason it's put by fire, that fire is the most consuming thing that we have. It absolutely consumes, it destroys everything, fire does. Well then, it'll be in there, but you'll have a soul that'll have to be punished through some kinds of... You have to watch the word fire because the Holy Ghost is used. Holy Ghost and fire, because Holy Ghost fire burns sin out. See? And makes clean. But this fire, it comes from uh, hell. It's at a lake of fire, and ever what it is, it's a punishment with torment. The rich man lifted up his eyes being in hell and said, Sam Lazarus with a little water on his fingers to put on my lips for these flames are tormenting me. Don't think there is a burning hell and a literal hell. There is. If there's a literal devil, there's a literal hell. But you see, everything that's perverted has an end to it because it finally must come back to that purity and holiness of God. And God is eternal, and if we have eternal life, God is in us, and we can no more die than God can die. There you are. Now, the text really explains itself, see, and makes it right. Now, let's see. I had a... I don't know whether... Yes, what will, uh, what will become of them? They become extinct. There's no more to them. The soul goes. The spirit goes. The life goes. The body goes. The thoughts goes. The memory goes, and there will be no more thoughts of even evil or it ever, ever happened in glory. That's right. It'll all be... Could you imagine that here would be people over here in this part? Don't the Bible say even the thoughts of the wicked shall perish? The very thoughts of it will perish. Here will be a man over here. Here's God, the great Holy One here, and no one right out enters the pit with souls burning in it. Well, that couldn't be heaven. The very thoughts, the very memory, everything that's perverted, every evil thought, everything will perish, everything that's evil in it. And we'll be nothing but purity with Zoe, the life of God, to eternity and for our ages roll on, 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 and on, and on. It'll never end. Be eternal. They went into everlasting punishment, but the righteous went into eternal life. You get it? Everlasting punishment, eternal life. What a difference. Now, see, it doesn't. Now, I know to you, my dear little young'uns, I, I don't mean to try to present myself as a know-it-all. If I do that, now I've got three or four more good questions. I'll pick them up Sunday morning, the Lord willing. Now, look, see, these rise questions. I'm an old preacher. I, 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 I've 26 years in the ministry. And I, I am very grateful for this, that I can say this. My, I have never tried to try to present anything in my life without first it being revealed. And I'm so thankful that the angel of the Lord, which I had no education, no ability, and this angel come down and has been my help sent from God. And he has never told me one thing but what absolutely dovetailed from Genesis Revelations was that. In so much that I wrote down right quick when he said, and you, and you shall take a gift of divine healing. Now I put it down this way, he said it. And about three years later, the manager called my, my attention to it. said, Brother Branham, did you notice that? That's so perfect till he told you a gift. See? Never said the gift. And uh, every... Every one in the Bible, every gift is the gift, but divine healing, and it's a gift. It's gifts of healing. You can have all kinds of gifts of healing different ways. But every other is the gift, the gift of prophecy, the gift of this. But divine healing is in the plural gifts. And I never noticed that, that the Holy Spirit is so perfect. Oh, blessed be the Lord. Do you understand that the same Holy Ghost that wrote that Bible by hundreds of men, hundreds of years apart, and not one of them divvied one from the other? 
Every one of them was completely. One never even heard of the other one. And Paul went down and was down in um, Arabia and never even visited Jerusalem for 14 years. But was down in Jerusalem and down, went for another, went to Jerusalem, but down in Arabia and started preaching, never even seen Peter and the rest of them for 14 years. And when they come together, they were preaching the very same thing. Water baptism in the name of Jesus Christ and divine healing in the power of God. Oh, I'm so glad that I can say I'm one of them. One of them. I'm one of them. I'm so glad that I can say I'm one of them. Hallelujah. One of them. I'm one of them. Just so glad that I can say I'm one of them. There are people almost everywhere whose hearts are all on flame. With this fire that fell at Pentecost, that cleansed and made them clean. Oh, it's burning now within my heart. Oh, glory to his name. I'm so glad that I can say I'm one of them. They were gathered in the upper room, all praying in his name. They were baptized with the Holy Ghost, and power for service came. Now what he did for them that day, he'll do for you the same. I'm so glad that I can say I'm one of them. I'm one of them. I'm one of them. I'm so glad that I can say I'm one of them. Hallelujah. One of them. One of them. I'm so glad I can say I'm one of them. Listen, I got a little message for you. Come, my brother, seek this blessing that will cleanse your heart from sin. That will start the joy bells ringing and will keep your soul on flame. Oh, it's burning now within my heart. Oh, glory to his name. I'm so glad that I can say I'm one of them. Aren't you glad you're one of them? What is it? It's the Spirit that reveals. It's a revelation of God. Upon this rock, I don't care if an archbishop, the Catholic priest sat not long ago in my house. And he said, Mr. Branham, I come to ask you a question. I said, all right, sir. He said, I have a letter here from the bishop to you. I said, all right, sir. He said, the statements that you make when you hold your hand and solemnly swear you tell the truth. I said, I will not. I said, the Bible said, swear not at all by heavens or by earth or it's his footstool. Let your age be in If the bishop wants to hear what i got to say, he'll take my word for it. If you don't, I don't swear. There's a little priest up here at the Sacred Heart Church. He said, did you baptize Pauline Frazier on a certain, certain date? I said, I did, sir. Down the Ohio River. said, how did you baptize her? I said, I baptized her by immersing her beneath the water in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. He put it down. He said, you know, Catholic Church used to baptize like that. I said, when? He said, in the early age. I said, what early age? He said, well, at the beginning. I said, what beginning? He said, in the Bible. I said, you mean the, er and the disciples? He said, sure. I said, you call the Catholics, uh, the, the, you say the disciples were Catholics? He said, sure they were. I said, I thought the Catholic Church didn't change. He said, it doesn't. I said, then why did Peter say, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ? And you said that was, he was a pope? Yes. Then why do you baptize in the name of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? And he immersed and you sprinkled. Now what's happened? He said, but you see, said the Catholic Church has power to do anything they want to do. <laughs> I said, and you call the disciples Catholics? He said, yeah. I said, sir, I've got Josephus. I've got the Fox Book of Martyrs. I've got Pemberman's Early Ages. I've got the um, Hossus II Babylons, the most ancient histories that there is in the world. Show me in there where the Catholic Church has ever ordained or ever come into an organization 600 years after the death of the last apostle. Or he said, we believe what the church says. I said, I believe what the Bible says. Right? Well, he said, God's in his church. I said, God's in his word. I said, if God, he said, I said, the Bible doesn't say God's in his church, but the, God, the Bible said God's in his word. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and dwelt among us. That's right. I said, God's in his word. He went on out and told that. He said, well, we couldn't argue. He said, because you believe in the Bible. I believe in the church. 
I said, I believe that the Bible is God's inspired word, and there's not one contradiction in it, and it's God's word and his eternal plans for the whole ages to come. He said, heavens and earth will pass away, but my word shall not pass away. That's right. I believe the word. He went out to Miss Frazier. He said, Miss Frazier, will you sign a paper here consenting that your girl can be a member of the Catholic Church? She said, I'd rather walk with her to the grave. He said, shame on you. That you ought to be thankful of that girl's coming out of that nonsense into the Catholic Church. He said, what if it was your girl coming to my church? What would you say about it? Oh, he said, that's different. He said, no, it's not. <laughs> he knew he'd been somewhere when he left that little woman out there. <laughs> he knew he'd been somewhere. She said, now the same door's open as you come in at. <laughs> that's the way. Don't be run over. You don't have to be run over. If God's for you, who can be against you? Right. The trouble of it is today you got a wishbone instead of a backbone. Stand for God and right. The same Holy Ghost that come down on those apostles and back in the ages is still in His church today, those who God has revealed Himself to. Not Him that willeth or Him that runneth, but God that showeth mercy. It's God by His election brings the people and opens their eyes. You can never see it. You're blind and never could see unless God opens your understanding. The Bible said you're blind. And you can't see. There's no need of you trying to all the education and scholarship you could get. You just constantly get blinder. Now, you Church of Christ here, you speak where the Bible speaks and silent where it's silent. What about some of this? You might have silent on that. <laughs> right. See, it takes spiritual revealed truth. Then God comes down and reveals Himself and vindicates it to be the truth. Amen. Amen. You love Him? Amen. So do I. <laughs> Amen. All right. All you Methodists want to shake hands with the Baptists now? You Presbyterians? Now do you say, Brother Brown, do you disfellowship Baptists and Presbyterians that don't bab? No, sir, I don't. I consider them my brothers. Absolutely. I don't care if he's not baptized all of you. He's baptized in the name of Rose of Sharon, Lily of the Valley, and the Morning Star. I wouldn't have it. I'd be just as good as Father, Son, Holy Ghost. His three titles. He was a Rose of Sharon, was he? The Lily of the Valley, the Morning Star. All those, sure he was. Just one thing or another, but here's what it is. The correct scripture way is in the name of Jesus Christ. If you want scripture way, that's exactly. That's the correct way. Now, if you're baptized in the name of Father, Son, Holy Ghost, if you like it, that's all right. Amen. If it's a good answer to God, towards a clear conscience to God, amen. Go right ahead. See, but as far as I am concerned, as far as my part, if you'd ask me, say, Brother Bram, should I be baptized over? I'd say yes to my part. The little woman come here the other day said, The Lord called me to be a preacher. I didn't believe that. Not no more than I believed that, that she could jump over the moon. And she, I said, Well, that's very good, sister. I said, Are you married? Yes. Got two children? Yeah. I said, what, Is your husband saved? No. I said, What are you going to do with him? Go leave him home. I said, That's the best bait the devil ever had. Amen. You're a pretty woman to begin with, and you slipping off out here in a field, you'll be a regular bait and a target for the devil, and your husband home a young man, and you leading with these two children, you'll start running around with another woman, and these kids will have another daddy one of these days. I said, the first place of God called a woman, he contradicted his word. I said, now, if you want to, that's all right. And I said, now, discernment. You say the Lord give you discernment. Do you want to go out to the platform and try it? She said, yes. And you see what happened. You see? It's enthused. It's got to come to the Word. If it's not in the Word, then it's not right. I don't care what your emotions are. It's not right. Amen. Amen. That sounds good. <laughs> Amen. All right. <clears throat> we walk in the line. Such a beautiful line. Come where the dew drops off. Shine all around us by day and by night. He's the light. All ye saints of light proclaim Jesus, the light of the world. Then the bell of heaven. Such a beautiful life. I'm where the dew drops shine all around us by day and by night. Jesus, I know. Now I want 
everyone to turn around and shake hands four ways with everybody now as we sing this again. We walk in the light. the Presbyterian, the Catholic, the all you love them all, say amen. We walk in the light of beauty. Shaking hands as we go. Oh, come where the dew drops of mercy are Shine all around us but sing our dismissing song. Now, it's possible that I'll be here again Sunday. Now, after that, I won't be back no more until after Christmas. See? Because I'm going to Michigan, from Michigan to Colorado, from Colorado over to Idaho, from Idaho over into California, and we'll be back. And it's possible, I want you to pray for me, I'll be in Waterloo, Iowa, beginning on January the 24th until February the 2nd. See, at a big arena there, just got the call a while ago, and I got now to Sunday to pray. See, at Waterloo Highway, which is close now. But now remember, listen to the brother's broadcast at 9 o'clock Saturday morning. We'll call him and let him know. And that'll be over WLRP, the Neville Quartet, at 9 o'clock Saturday morning. We'll, if, I, if I don't get to take him, Brother Neville will finish the questions, will you, Brother Neville, for Sunday morning? <laughs> they go on. Well, look, if, if, if you get in trouble, I'll, I'll run with you. I'll <laughs> you look. All right. All right. Take the name of Jesus that believes in shouting, that's the kind of shouting I believe in. Hey, that old hey, mother just sitting there and the spirit come up on her. She started screaming. She couldn't hold it. She walked hey, back and hugged her daughter. That's the way I like to see it. Hey, Amen. That's real good old-fashioned heartfelt feelings. Oh, my nose. No season right and saint. Ready hey, to go man. home to glory. Just waiting to summon, you see. Praise just God. having a wonderful time. Hallelujah. All right. Brother Neville now. Whatever he wants to do.